Hi year 10, welcome back to English language. So this is our second week on paper one question five. But as usual, we start our lesson with our interleaved retrieval bell task. So as usual, the questions that are in the red boxes are from last week. The questions that are in the amber boxes are from power and conflict poetry from last term. And the questions in the green box are from an inspector calls. So as usual, Pause this recording, make sure that you spend a good five minutes making really detailed notes and recalling everything that you can, especially from the power and conflict poetry and especially from an inspector calls. Okay, welcome back year 10. So we'll start with the questions from last lesson. So how many marks is paper one question five worth? It's worth 40 marks. Remember, it's 50% of paper one and it's 25% of your overall GCSE for English language. So it's a real high tariff question. Our suggested six part structure follows, is as follows rather. So paragraph one, an overview of the setting. Paragraph two, a description, focus on a key object. Paragraph three is where we introduce and describe our character. And remember, if there's no character in our image, we can drop one in. Paragraph four is our shift in focus or time or mood. Paragraph five is the impact that the aftermath of that shift. And paragraph six is where we return to the overview and we have that circular structure. So moving on to power and conflict poetry. So which poems present the power of time? The first one that I want to mention is Ozymandias. Um, Ozymandias was a leader who believed that his legacy would last. But as the poem ends, we see that his power has decayed. And remember that lovely oxymoron, that idea of the colossal wreck that's boundless and bare. And we've got the power of time and power of nature that has levelled things out. And by the end of the poem, Ozzy has lost his power through time. The next poem that I want to mention is My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. And the reason why I want to mention the Duke is because he specifically refers to 900 years, which is obviously a long period of time. And it's symbolic of the legacy that he believes he's inherited, but the legacy that he's going to continue providing through having a new duchess so he can have a male heir to continue that idea. By the end of that poem, unlike Ozzy, the Duke has not lost his power. He consistently has this level of power and authority all the way through throughout the poem due to his status and due to this 900 year old name. And I think it's really symbolic by the fact that at the end of the poem, he refers to Neptune, notice Neptune taming a seahorse. So he believes that his power, this man-made power is everlasting, it's not temporary at all. Um, the next poem that I want to refer to is Exposure Through Time. And there's the repetition of that line at the end of each stanza, but nothing happens, but nothing happens, but nothing happens. And it's this idea that these soldiers are stuck in time in this horrific battle, not necessarily with the enemy soldiers, but this horrific battle with Mother Nature. And the only way that they are going to escape this negative continu continuous suffering is actually by dying. Um, I also want to refer to bayonet charge and I'm just going to leap over to the killer quotation that I've included for bayonet charge and there's this whole idea that in bayonet charge I always visualise the soldier at the start almost in slow motion it refers to them stumbling over the clods and they're really physically struggling at the start especially in stanza one with the repetition of raw raw and raw hot seamed khaki and then the second stanza 
is where the soldier actually starts to question things and we'll go inside the soldier's head and we've got this quotation in what called clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second and the harsh alliteration on called clockwork it's i think it's a reference to a higher power a higher establishment and at this moment We've got this one individual soldier. Was he the hand pointing that second? And you've got this imagery of a clock and we've got the hands going round and it's a specific, specific reference to the second. And my understanding of that is that this soldier is fearing that his time is up at this point in this poem, unless he changes and unless he becomes this weapon of all weapon of war where he realizes he's going to die stumbling on that battlefield unless he plunges forward which he actually does later on and moving over to an inspector calls so what can we recall about the character of eric berlin i think the first thing to note that's really important is his introduction he's introduced as half shy half assertive the repetition of half i think is really important and my deeper interpretation of that is at the start of the play just like sheila he's not fully formed he's half of something and half of something else but by the end of the play, he's fully formed into this individual who, just like his sisters, found his voice, found his opinions because he's allowed himself to be re-educated by the inspector. But he's half shy, half assertive. Now, at the start of the play, I think Eric asks some very perceptive questions and he's shot down by his dad. He's shot down by Arthur Berlin. And one of them is, well, what about war? And... Eric is from the younger generation and he's asking a really important question there and Mr Berlin's response is fiddlesticks to war, the Germans don't want war and we realise how ignorant Mr Berlin is to the real world as a result of that but more importantly we understand that Eric's got an awareness of the real world but he just hasn't been given the right education by his parents Another key thing about Eric Berlin is his reliance on alcohol and the fact that his parents are absolutely blind to it. Sheila's not. She, Sheila describes him as being squiffy in Act 1, but his parents are completely blind to the reality that he's experiencing as well. And it appears that Eric has been a very privileged young man, but as a result of having these privileges, he hasn't taken any responsibility for his actions until he meets Inspector Gill. And we've got this huge contrast of the Berlins drinking their port and champagne, and we've got Eva drinking bleach. So we've got a huge contrast there of lifestyles as a result of the class that people have been born into. Also, a real key moment from the play with regards to Eric is his relationship with Eva and the fact that it appears that he forced himself on her. And at this point in the play, when we look back on Eric's behaviour, it's very obvious that he's a character who's abused his power and abused his masculinity. Just like Gerald and old Joe, he met Eva at the Palace Bar. And the fact that the quotation where it's from the inspector and he's referred to forcing himself on her and treating her like an animal at the end of a drunken night. Very, very similar to how old Joe Megadie had wedged her into a corner. And it's a very serious action and it's got very serious consequences. The final thing I'd like to say about Eric is by the end in Act 3, he stands up to his parents he is absolutely distraught at the fact when he finds out that Mrs Berlin has turned Eva away and he refers to the fact that you've killed your own grandchild. He then turns to his father and he says, you're not the type of chap a father 
that you're not the type of father a chap can go and speak to. So by the end of the play, we can understand that Eric has not had this comfortable family that had first appeared from the pink and intimate setting right at the start. And that takes us to the final question from what can you recall from the stage directions at the beginning of Act 1? I think the first thing that's of real key importance is that the Berlins live in a fairly large suburban house and they've got good solid furniture of the period, symbolic of their wealth and their position in society. But also what I think is actually more telling is where Priestley includes in the stage, direct, stage directions that the house is not cosy and home-like. So although they've got the privileges, they haven't got the privileges from being a happy family. Secondly, we're introduced to all of the characters, but Edna is just clearing the table, which was which has no cloth of dessert plates, plates and champagne glasses and replacing them with a decanter of port, cigar box and cigarettes. All of those items on the table are symbolic of the privileges and the wealth of the Burlings. And then we have the character descriptions. Arthur Burling is a heavy looking, rather portentous man in his middle 50s. Mrs Burlin is about 50 a rather cold woman and her husband's social superior. Sheila is a pretty girl in her early 20s. Notice the fact that the first thing that's mentioned about Sheila is her physical appearance. She's very pretty. Just like how Sheila, the first thing she asks about Ava Smith was, was she, very, was she pretty? And we've then got Gerald, who's also described in a similar way to Sheila an attractive chap about 30. Everything in this stage directions is focused on appearance. So the fact that they've got a nice home, they've got good solid furniture, the people within it are attractive, but they are all flawed. And then we've got Eric. He's in his early 20s, he's not quite at ease, so he is not comfortable in this family. He's half shy, and he's half assertive. So yeah, 10, this is our third lesson on paper one, question five. Last week, we're really focused on the first half of our description. Today and tomorrow's lessons are going to be focused on creating a shift in tone and time and being able to contrast our language in the second half of our writing and creating a circular structure. So our paragraph six links back to paragraph one. So our challenge objective is to understand how to plan a shift in tone in a piece of descriptive writing. And our aspirational target is to construct an engaging shift, something that's interesting, something that your reader will want to read on and explore a variety of structural features. So like the key vocabulary that I've just mentioned, we want, we want you to explore using a shift in tone and time, contrast in language and circular structure. Moving on to our start of year 10. So I just really want to start with focusing on our character in understanding how to plan a shift in tone. So last week we looked at this image and we described this man in negative way last week. We described him in the present day and old. Now, to sh create a shift in tone in time, we now need to think about our character in a former life. So, what was he like in the past and what was he like as a young man? So what I want you to do now is I want you to spend the next couple of minutes creating a past life for your character. So thinking about what was he like and look back at your description of him as an old man last week. How could you describe him in a young, as a young man in a much more positive way? So I've just included a few options here for you. So first of all, you could describe him during the war in a battle. And you could actually use the extract from Birdsong as an inspiration. You could describe him being a hero. 
receiving a medal for his actions at a prestigious ceremony dressed in his fine uniform. Or you could describe him not as a soldier or a hero at all, but with his love and family and not being alone and not being lonely in this house. So think about what his past physical appearance was, how you described it and where you were describing him. And then thinking about how you could change that. So if you're going back in time, what does he look like? How is he different? How are his eyes different? How, are his, how is his skin different? How's his smile different? But also, in what different location are you imagining him? So spend a couple of minutes doing that. Create a little bullet point list. Create a little mind map of all possibilities. And then I'll talk you through how I would create and structure mine. So yeah, 10, you've just started planning the second half of your writing by starting to think about your character in a past life. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk you through the way that I would structure mine. And then I'll show you how I would write it up and then you'll be ready to write part of yours up. So last week, I successfully described an overview of the setting. I described the weather outside and it was negative. I then came inside the image and I described the house, this clean bathroom, and I described it as negative and harsh because I wanted the negativity to continue. And the final thing that I described last week was my character. So I zoomed in on that key character and again I described them physically in a negative way. So for my shift, I'm going to have a short sentence as a, as a one word sentence paragraph, time wasn't always so cruel. I want to have the ellipsis there and I want to have the a correct apostrophe there because that'll get me more marks for technical accuracy. And then this is what I'm then going to do. I'm then going to describe my character in the past. So if you have a look at the right hand side of this screen, you will see that I've put a red box around the younger version of the man. And underneath, it's going to be the character in the past. So I'm going to describe them as a younger man. I'm then going to go on to describe a war scene, which is going to be a huge contrast to the clean bathroom and the house from paragraph two. So you should see that my paragraph four and five will really contrast to my paragraph one, two and three. Once I've described the physical appearance of my character and then once I've described the location, this battlefield, I'm then going to return to the weather. But this time, instead of just repeating this negative description of the weather, it's going to actually be a positive description of the weather and I'm going to try and include a little symbol. I'm going to include some sunlight and I'm going to describe a flower potentially and more probably a poppy in the sense of because then that could represent all of these soldiers. So I hope that makes sense. If you need to go back to the audio from the beginning and listen to that again, feel free to do so. Right, year 10. So what you will see on this slide is a worked example. So on the left hand side in the white box is my teacher model example of my description from last week. So I've put paragraph numbers down the side. So just refresh your memory of my paragraph one, my paragraph two on a key object, which is the place that he is, paragraph three, the description of him. And then at the bottom, I've just put my shift, my one sentence paragraph, but comma, time was not always so cruel. So just have a quick read through of that and just refresh your memory. Okay, so moving on to paragraph five, which is the impact of my shift. The way that I've done this is by using some words and phrases from paragraph three, but I've contrasted them, I've completely flipped them, I've switched them. So let's start with 
the first paragraph. This lone warrior was once encapsulated by the admiration of his comrades and the tender love of his family. So if you look at my first my first sentence from paragraph three, have they used that verb encapsulated? But when I've went back in time, he's encapsulated by something else, something more positive. Smiling, waiting to be reunited, determined on surviving the barrage and onslaught of the German machine gunners and snipers. And we've got a triplet there, just like I had a triplet in paragraph three. But this time it's a lot more positive. So instead of staring, waiting, reminiscing, I've got smiling, waiting to be reunited, determined on surviving the barrage. Okay. It then moves on to start describing him. Physically strong and internally strong. His sapphire eyes are shining light on the devastation that he is surrounded by. And again, if you look back in paragraph three, it's a contrast to physically weak but internally strong. When he was younger, he was strong in every instance. And I've referred back to his sapphire eyes, but this time they're not dull or diluted. They're a shining light. I've then ended the first part of my section for paragraph five, desperate to win, not lose. And again, it's another reference to his weathered skin is evidence of the battles he has won and lost. I've then moved on to describe the location that he's in. This soldier was not yet lifeless, like the empty shells that lay on the decimated ground. And again, I've used something from paragraph two there. The broken skin of a forgotten land. And I've used a phrase there from actually paragraph one. A wound that was oozing copious amounts of human life. So in this short paragraph, I'm really describing the battlefield. No escape, no life, nothing. And I've repeated that short sentence structure from my paragraph two, but this time in a different context. But inside the lone warrior, there was a spark of life. And I've included that idea from paragraph two again. A resurgence. His time was not yet up. He was not ready to be extinguished. He was ready to be ignited as he clutched the loving letter from his beloved close to his heart and smiled. So the impact of my shift in time is a lot more positive to my description of my character from my paragraph two and three. What I've highlighted and put in red are the words and phrases that contrast for that contrast of language. So what I'd like you to do now is just have a read through again that as a whole piece, because that piece of writing is pretty much finished apart from my sixth paragraph. And at this point, your turn, you should be ready to give it a go for your turn. So what I'd like you to do now that you've seen a worked example, I want you to now create your paragraph four and five. Now, if you want to, like me, you can use a one sentence paragraph for your shift, for your change, for your flashback. You can use exactly the same one as me. OK and then describe this character in a different context, a different scenario, in a different place, in a different time. So think about every word you write. Is it your best? Make sure that your adjectives and verbs are powerful. Ensure your sentence starters are varied. Don't overly use the or as or he. Start with a powerful verb or adverb instead. 
and ensure you include sentences that are different lengths. You may want to use mine as a model. I don't mind that at all. There might be a few words and phrases that you want to adapt, that you want to recycle and reuse. You may want to think about the way that I've used sentence structures. Can you use similar sentence structures? So spend the next 10 minutes or so crafting your fourth and fifth paragraph and try and make links between them year 10 just like we would have picked out in a paper one question three structure so this is all about being able to explore and construct an interesting and engaging shift in a piece of writing and finally year 10 we're now ready to look at our sixth paragraph, the weather. So if we think about paragraph one that we completed last week, we described the weather in a negative way. And the structural feature I really want us to try and use today in this part of the lesson is a circular structure. So what I want us to try and create is a positive way to describe the weather in our final paragraph. Now at the bottom of this slide, I've just included five words or phrases that I use to describe the weather in my initial opening paragraph. So I used the bleak clouds, I used encompassed, I used a relentless attack, I used the gritty wind, and I used the broken skin. Spend the next couple of minutes considering how you could actually describe the weather in a contrasting way. So instead of the bleak clouds, what could there be that's a positive? A cloudless sky. And think about your adjectives. Make sure that they're the most powerful ones. So spend a couple of minutes trying to get some ideas together and use the images for inspiration too. And what you'll find on this slide, year 10, is my full description, my full piece of writing. The only thing that I've added at the bottom is my sixth, sixth paragraph. So you'll see that I'm starting in the same way as I did my first paragraph. So creeping from above, the warm and tender sun encompassed and caressed those tarnished eyes. So again, I've used that powerful verb encompassed but I've created a much more positive focus and tone. An act of remembrance and honour. The gritty wind dropped. So again, a reference from my first paragraph. As the beams of light embraced the blossoming poppies of the gone but never forgotten. And here I've played around with my sentence structure. So, in my first paragraph I ended it with no light, no joy, no hope, nothing. And I've ended my final paragraph with light, joy, hope, everything. So we've got that circular structure, but we've got a huge contrast. So before you add that sixth paragraph to your own, read through my full description and then add your short paragraph describing the weather in a positive way. We've now reached our plenary year 10 for today. So it's time to rag rate our skills from today and recap what we've been able to achieve. So as usual, on the right hand side, we've got our skills from today, six of them. So See which ones you feel that you are confident in. Remember, it's green for confident. Amber, you're all right, but you know you need to practice it a little bit more. And red, you struggled and you know that you need some work on this. You, need, you know that you need to work on it and you need some help on it. On the left hand side is the second half of my piece of writing. So my shift, my impact and my overview. And again, now that you've completed the same amount of writing, feel, feel free to go back and improve any element and reuse and adapt any of my 
vocabulary, any of my sentence structures. And that brings us to the end of our third lesson on paper one, question five, year 10. So just starting with our key vocabulary, we've looked at how to create a shift in tone in time. We've looked at contrast in language and we've looked at a circular structure. I'm really hoping that everybody has understood how to plan a shift in tone in a piece of descriptive writing. And you've actually been able to construct an interesting and engaging shift and you've actually explored using a variety of the structural features mentioned in our key vocabulary. So thank you very much for taking part in today's lesson. Tomorrow we're going to continue focusing on the second half of our writing and we're going to finish off a piece of writing that was started last week. So have a good day and you will hear from me soon.